Okay, so let's talk about Achrimos. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to interject. I'm here to learn. All right. So, quick summary of the Parsha. We have at the beginning of the Parsha. I think actually this is, um, I think we've been doing this class for a year now. I think we started Achrimos. So, we have Chalant to celebrate. All right, so a quick summary of the Parsha. First, we have the death of Aaron's two sons. It's on page 636. We have the death of Aaron's two sons. He, they went in to bring an offering at the temple to bring the Katoris. They weren't supposed to, and they passed away because of that. Then we have the Yom Kippur service and some laws about Yom Kippur. We've got the prohibition of Shchute Chutz at 636. Shchute Chutz is, is a prohibition to slaughter animals, holy animals, outside of the temple confines. The back when we had a base of Migdash, we would slaughter animals and bring them in the temple and we would spritz their blood on the altar. We'll talk a little bit about why specifically the blood was spritzed on the altar and not something else. And that served as an atonement, but one was not allowed to slaughter the animals outside of the temple complex. Okay, then we have the prohibition of eating blood. There's a mitzvah to cover blood when you slaughter a chicken or uh, what's called a chaya, so like a deer, or I don't know, any other chayas, maybe a giraffe. Undom- undomesticated animals. Undomesticated animals. I'm trying to think of examples of giraffes. People don't eat giraffes so much. Mm-hmm. But cows, you don't do it. Cows and lambs, you don't do it. Most common is chickens. So if you ever, the, w- the way you're supposed to do kaparos is they slaughter it in front of you. You know, before you make kippur, you take the chicken over the head. So the way that you're supposed to do it after is that they slaughter the chicken in front of you because you're supposed to think that that's you, you know, because of your sins before you make kippur and that it gets slaughtered. And when you slaughter the chicken, you cover it with uh, in and dirt. But I'm just thinking out loud. I think a giraffe is a chaya. giraffe you could shecht, and you would need a lot of dirt to, to cover the blood that's going to come out of a giraffe. I was told it cost $10,000, a giraffe. I think the shul should do a fundraiser. We should get a giraffe, and we should make a seam on something and eat it. Yeah, okay. well, good luck to find a shul that's willing to do it. I have a friend who would do it. I can imagine what a giraffe would like. I, I was told it tastes very gamey. It's very gamey. Yeah. I don't know what that no, means. I didn't know about a giraffe is it's the same game as a cat, but that's my world. All uh, right. Okay. That's the trivia question. That's the trivia answer. If you want, if you want to eat cats, you can go to China. That we no, don't. That you. we don't. Okay. I just treat them. Thank you. <laughs> then there's a prohibition to not imitate the practices of the Canaanim, the Canaanites, and the Egyptians, which we'll see applies to idolaters and the other nations. Then we have forbidden relationships. We have molech. There used to be a certain type of idolatry where they would take a, someone would take their child and they would pass him through fire. They would literally kill their children and sacrifice them to their gods by passing them through fire. So, and that was considered a normal thing. So the Torah had to come and make it forbidden. So anytime you think that, hey, everybody else is doing this, it's got to be right and you feel some peer pressure, just remember, back in the day, it was normal to take your child and to sacrifice him to a pagan god by passing him through fire. Ish, ish, me beis Yisrael, any person from the house of Israel, minager, hagar, b'seicham, from a convert, amongst the Jewish people, a sher yoichel, called them who, who eats blood, when asati fane banefesh, I place my countenance upon that soul, ha'ochel asas adam, who eats the blood, he will be cut off from the people of Israel. Now, whenever the Torah says kares, hikrati, that means their soul was cut off. Our souls connect all the way up to the upper worlds through chains and different spiritual connections. And when we do actions, though our actions impact the spiritual world and therefore and thereby impacting the physical world. So when a person does a sin, when the Torah says kares, his soul gets cut off. From that chain, also he he or she dies earlier. So blood, and this is one of the most severe punishments in the Torah. Blood is something which incurs that penalty. So the pasuk psukim continue ki nefesh habat the because the soul of the flesh is in the blood. Vani nesati lechem al mizbeach, and I put them on the altar lechaper al nafshe seichem to atone for their uh, to atone for their souls. Because the blood will be redeemed. Like we mentioned earlier, the part of the service in the temple where the the atonement was received was when the blood was collected from the animal into a pot. 
into a vessel, and it was spritzed, it was poured on the Mizbeach. So that's what we do with the blood, but we don't eat the blood. Okay, now Mark to the Bnei Israel, therefore I say to the Jewish people, Kol Nefesh Mikem Lo Soichel Dam, all of you don't eat blood, and the stranger who lives amongst you, being a convert, shouldn't eat blood. Okay, so, prohibition clearly is blood, very serious. But how come? What's the reason? So I would like to learn the reason that the Rambam gives and the reason that the Ramban gives. Two of the greatest rabbis of all time. So the Rambam says like this, he writes in Mar Nebuchim, Ki hai kastim me'usim hadam. The Kastim, they were idolaters who lived in Babylon. I think it comes from Or Kastim, which is really where Abraham was from. It's a city in Babylon. I think you can still see the ruins there. If you want to go to Iraq, that is. So they were repulsed by blood. They thought it was impure. Aval. There were a certain group of idolaters who lived in Kastim, even though most of them were disgusted by blood. There were a certain group amongst them who were idolaters, and they thought that if you eat the blood, that will give you a certain connection to demons and help you predict the future. That's what they thought. And the Torah has in mind to show the stupidity of these ideas, the silliness of these ideas. So, and the Torah, therefore, forbid blood. So you see many things in the Torah. Excuse me. They're forbidden so that we stay away from idolatry. Idolatry is a very serious sin in the Torah, obviously. Even the Rambam even says milk and meat. What's the reason that we don't eat milk and meat? Because idolaters used to do it. Have milk and meat together. So therefore we don't do it. So he's saying here again that the reason that we don't, ha- that we don't eat blood is because idolaters used to eat it because they thought it would help them get in contact spiritually with demons and they could tell the future. So... It says how silly those ideas are, and therefore what the Torah says is that you should purify, actually use the blood for purification purposes by sprinkling it on the Zbeach, by sprinkling it on the altar in the temple. So we use it for the exact other reason. So that's the prohibition to eat blood. Now the Ramban, though, he does not like this so much. Oh, skip, this is the question. He says, actually, what the Rambam writes makes a lot of sense. It's a lot of logical reason why we're not allowed to eat blood. But if you read the verses in the Torah, it doesn't sound like that. So he's saying that logically the rabbi makes sense. But if you look in the Pesukim in the Torah, it doesn't really sound like that. What is the reason that the Torah always gives? Because the soul of the flesh is in the blood. Animals, as a veterinarian, you'll be very pleased to hear this. Animals have a soul. Uh, obviously a lower soul than human beings, but they have a soul, they have a nefesh. Maybe even a level of the ruach, which is a higher level of the soul, but they have the life, uh, the nefesh is the life force which causes them to know to eat, to procreate, to run from danger. That's a life force that makes them different from a plant. Right? They have that life force. So if you read the verse in the Torah, it says that the life force is in the blood. So while the Rambam makes sense logically that you know, the Torah would want us to get away from idolaters, it sounds like it has something to do. The Torah doesn't want us to eat the life force. That's the reason the Torah is giving us, so it's a different reason. So it's important to know that God created everything on earth for human beings. Now why? Why did he create everything for human beings? This line is very important. You know, He's writing about blood here, but in his paragraph about blood, he's telling you, some very profound ideas. He says, everything is created for human beings. Why? Because that is the only creation that could recognize their creator. The only creation on planet Earth in the universe, okay, I don't know the universe, I won't get into that, but on planet Earth at least, that could recognize the creator is a human being. We have free will. We can choose to recognize God, to make him a melech over us. That's why we come to shul, right? Why do, what, this, this is what Ramban writes in Parsha's bow. We come to synagogue so we can all say, you're our creator. And it's a big Kedosh Hashem. Not only that, that's what God created us for. So since human beings were the only beings that were created for that purpose, everything else is here for us. Now, if a human being doesn't live for that purpose, maybe he doesn't have such a merit to, you know, to, to be there. But Afal, P. Cain, Even though everything was, was created for us, for human beings, do you know at the beginning of creation that we weren't allowed to eat animals? Everyone had to be a vegetarian. It says that... 
Right, right. Masati lechem is called Esav Zero Zero. You could eat all the plants. Now, what Mark's saying is that until the time of Noah, then it changed. Then we're allowed to eat animals. What changed? Because the animals only existed after Noah because of Noah. It was in his merit, right? They would have been drowned by the flood had Noah not saved them. So since Noah saved them, it gave all of his descendants, which are us, all humanity descended from Noah, gave them the privilege to eat flesh, to eat meat. Now, he goes on to say, But he says, really, you can eat the animal where we don't eat the blood because, the, like we said, the nefesh, the soul of the animal, is found in the blood. And he says, one soul should not eat another soul. We should not consume another soul. We can eat the flesh, but we can't eat the soul. And then he continues and he says, when you eat blood, it doesn't really digest the same way that regular food digests. When food digests in your system, then it's like the nutrients are taken out, it's converted to blood. But if you're just eating blood, it sounds like there's no conversion process. And he says, basically, the principle of you are what you eat. If you're eating the blood of an animal, then you're going to take on certain characteristics of the animal, which we don't want to happen. It was very interesting. That's why, that's the reason given that we don't eat non-kosher animals in general. Non-kosher animals are predatory animals, those animals that don't have split hooves. So we don't eat them because they become part of us. Uh, We don't want to have those attributes uh, become part of us. It's interesting here, he's just saying about the blood by kosher animals. I mean, because you can eat you can eat a cow, but you can't eat the cow's blood. That's why we're doing the salting. So I just thought it was interesting that when it comes to non-kosher animals, you can't eat any part of the animal because it's gonna we're going to take on some of those characteristics. But when it comes to kosher animals, we can eat the flesh, but we can't eat, and we can even eat the tongue, and we can eat every other part of the cow, just not the blood. Because the blood has the soul, the life force, and that would cause a person to take on those characteristics. Okay, so I just thought that was interesting. So we have two reasons why we can't eat blood. One is according to the Rambam because it's to keep us away from idolatry, and idolaters used to eat blood. And the other reason is the Ramban because a soul can't eat another soul, and we don't want to take on the characteristics of the animal. Okay, so there's another <coughs> prohibition. Any questions? Any comments on this, on blood? No? Yeah. So Jewish vampires would have a serious problem. Maybe Pikuach Nefesh, they'd have to eat the blood. I don't know. Have to ask your local Orthodox rabbi. Okay. They had one of those medical shows, like real medical shows or something. Mm-hmm, yeah. you know, like real real life in the ER, and like the guy thought he was a vampire or something. Oh, like, really? Yeah, crazy. He was like drinking blood, and it was like one of these weird... Mm-hmm. I met a guy, a Jewish guy, actually. He's like a, like a novice actor, so he was playing the doctor in the, the dramatization. Yeah, it was, but it was like a real story. Okay. Like they had to test him. And... Anyway, a lot of interesting people out there. Yeah, probably didn't go outside. And... Okay, so I want to talk about the other prohibition that we have here, one of the other ones in the Torah. Very interesting. This is very relevant. Page 648, Pasuk 18.3. It says like this. Mitzrayim bolo sasu. Like the deeds of the people of Egypt that you dwelt, don't do like them. There's a prohibition to imitate the Egyptians. Maybe Eschem Shama Lo Sasu. And like the Canaanites, I'm bringing you to the land of Canaan. They were before the Jewish people got to Israel. They were it was filled with idolaters, Canaanim. These were some of the people that were worshiping Molech by sacrificing their children to them. Very low people. It says, don't do what they do. Lo Sasa, Lo Sasu Lo Selechu. And don't go in their ways. Don't follow their ways. So the Rambam counts this as a negative prohibition, one of the 365 negative prohibitions. Let's say 30. He writes, There's a prohibition to go after the heretics, and to act like they act, even the way they dress, and their gathering places. And it says, Don't go in the ways of the Gentiles that I'm sending you from them. Ukfar uh Zeb Amru uh the the prohibition's already repeated when it says Bukukasem Los Elehu and their ways don't go. So it's not just the Kananim and the Egyptians that we can't follow their ways, but all of the Gentile nations were not allowed to follow in their ways. And he says it more specifically, this is a debate, I think a halachic debate, if it applies by only idolatrous nations or even all nations. I think the Vilna Garnis uh, holds it's by all nations. And we'll see go a little further in the, some of the Rishonim and the Postkim, see what's the reason for this. And I think this prohibition really brings out an important hashkafa, important 
viewpoint that we're supposed to have as Jews. So I would like to read a Rambam here. This is Hilchos Akam, Hilchos of Zara, 11.1. It says, don't go in the ways of the Gentile nations. Don't imitate the way that they dress, the way that they cut their hair. Uh, or in other ways, as it says, don't go in the ways of the Gentiles. Don't go in their ways. It says, lest you get ensnared by following after them. It's all one idea. To not be like them, to not be similar to them. Ella, yeah, Yisrael, moved on The Jewish people have to be separate. mabusho, they have to be recognized in the way that they dress. Uh, oh, sorry, ubeshar masav, and there are other the other ways that they act. Just like in their views and their values, the Jewish people are different. So too, they have to be different in the way that they dress and the way that they act. If you look at Rabbi Mr. Umansky here, you'll know he's Jewish by looking at him, right? That's why you wonder, everyone always wondered when I was a kid, why do those people from Lakewood dress so differently? Why do they dress so funny? This is why. The Jewish people are supposed to be distinct, supposed to be separate, and the non-Jews, they hate us for that. I mean, they also hate us when we assimilate, so either way, we you know, don't really have much of an option. But the Torah wants the Jewish people to be separate. Why? Because the Jewish people were charged with a special mission. We are charged with the mission of being a godly nation, which means studying the Torah, knowing what God wants from us, and acting according to the way that God wants. And we are required to be a, a cut above. That's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be that people can look and say, oh, that's how, that's how God wants a human being to behave. That's what we're supposed to be. So just like we're separate in our views, we have to be separate in the way we dress. And it says, I'll separate you from other people. Don't, if they have a specific type of dress that they wear, don't wear it. I actually got nervous once. I was in my college graduation. I was wearing the you know cap and gown, and I read they had like a little you know pamphlet, and it was explaining that the cap and gown originated the clerics used to wear them, the priests in Europe. And I'm sitting there wearing this thing, and I'm like, am I allowed to wear this? Because <laughs> that's a uh, interesting. I think in the end I was allowed to because it's not really specific to priest anymore, but you wouldn't be allowed to wear a priest collar. Obviously, I don't think they would be so into you wearing it either. And don't grow your hair like they grow their hair. How so? Don't shave the sides of your head. And leave the hair on top, right? Like the monks used to have. So the Ram saying, don't do that. You know, they used to shave, like, all around here and just leave the top. I think it's because they want to imitate the crown of thorns that Jesus wore. So, it's a prohibition to have your hair like that. It's called Beloris, that's the name of the haircut. Don't uh, cut the hair that's opposite the face. And behind. I think it's talking like some sort of Mohawk. Like they do. Don't build buildings like they, like they do. Like they do. You know, they, um, a lot of the, uh, as certain aspects of non-Orthodox temples were imitated based on the church, you know, having the Torah read from the front as opposed to the middle. So a lot of those synagogues are actually imitating the non-Jewish uh, places of worship. Now, for sure, back in the day, there was a whole discussion. This is probably part of the prohibition. They would have the Reformed rabbis would dress like the minister, the German minister, and they would have an organ in the temple. So this is all part of the prohibition, and that's exa- prohibition of not imitating the non-Jewish nations. And that's what they were trying to do, exactly. They were trying to imitate them. They didn't want the Jewish people to be separate. right? Literally, that's like the hallmark of non-Orthodox Judaism, is that we're going to take on the values of the culture and claim that that's Judaism so we can be accepted. And that's why, again, the Reformed rabbis dressed like, dressed like a minister. They changed the davening to the vernacular, took out Hebrew. And that's what we're doing. The Torah, though, clearly says not like that. We're supposed to have a special way of dress, a special way of acting to show that we're separate. And he says, someone who does any of these gets malchus. He gets, he gets uh, lashes. Now, practically, this actually this comes out practically a lot of uh, halachas. Uh, so the, the Ramah writes, which one I like, halacha lamaisa, that <coughs> he says the prohibition of imitating the way that the Gentile nations dress is anything that they wear, wear because of pretzus, because of immorality, he says, example, wearing bright red. He says that's the way their ministers would dress, was wear bright red. 
And he also says, anything that they wear that there's no reason for. They just, they, I don't know, let's say there's a custom, you know, in New Jersey that everyone from New Jersey would like wear a feather or something in their hair. That's like what all the non-Jews would do. So we wouldn't be allowed to do that because there's no reason. But if you're a doctor and you have to wear a coat so everyone knows you're a doctor, that you can do because there's a purpose. But the prohibition is to just do some random thing that has no purpose or if it's something because of immorality. There's an interesting shiloh that came up with Ramosha Feinstein which is relevant to this. Can you take off your yarmulke if it's going to cause you to lose your job if you keep it on? You have to go to work without a yarmulke. You ever see this chua before? Famous. Right. Famous chua. So are you allowed to take off the yarmulke? So there's a rule in the, in the Gemara that to, if you're faced with a choice to violate a negative prohibition in the Torah, let's say your boss says, steal this thing or I'm going to fire you, you have to lose your job and you have to give up all your money. You have to give up all your money to violate a negative prohibition. But when it comes to a positive commandment, let's say you have to go to work or you're not going to be able to shake lulav, you only have to give up a fifth of your assets. To violate a positive prohibition, positive commandment is much less severe than violating a negative prohibition. So, what is wearing a yarmulke? So the Taz actually writes that to take off your yarmulke would violate the prohibition of going in the ways of the non-Jews. Because non-Jewish people don't wear yarmulkes. So it would be violating the prohibition of don't go in their ways. So according to that, according to the Taz, if you have a choice, do I lose my job or take off my yarmulke, you'd have to lose your job. But Ramosha Feinstein says, don't worry, don't worry, i give you the, str- the stringent opinion first. Ramosha Feinstein says, we don't pass it like that, Taz, that's not, really, that's not the reason. And he says, even nowadays, the reason why non-Jews don't wear yarmulkes is not because of a religious reason, it's just because it's easier to have your head uncovered. So it's not because of religious purpose. So, right, it's just more comfortable. Because like we said from the Ramah, there's a difference if, right, if there's a reason why they wear something or don't wear something, there's a logical reason, or it's just something that they do, or if it's because of their laws or because of their religion. But I thought it might be re- this might be relevant... Let's say you're at a baseball game and they start playing the Star Spangled Banner. Everyone takes off their hat. Are you allowed to take off your yarmulke? So it would seem that that isn't a, pra- that isn't a practical reason. That's really a custom. That's more, of, I want to say religious, but a social custom that they take off the hat for the Star Spangled Banner. So that could be a negative prohibition of taking off your yarmulke for the Star Spangled Banner uh, because of Ubu Chukaseyah of uh, going in the ways of the non-Jewish nations. I'm not passing. I'm just no. speaking aloud. That I think, uh, I think, I think that makes sense. But it, no, you disagree? No, it's it, it, it comes into a very interesting question when you talk about the ways of the non-Jews versus custom versus what they do as proper etiquette. For example, a person who walks in when hat, as we know, the black hat, when hat used to be a <coughs> standard form of formal attire, it was taken off when you walked into a home. Right? It had nothing to do. It's just proper etiquette. You take off your hat when you walk into a home. That's it, it was just pr- called proper etiquette. Yeah. Now, what do they do? I mean, you take right. the hat. Uh, right. I mean, you'll see it especially in the military. Right. Yeah. They'll wear a cap outside, but they right. will take al- it off. they will always take it off yeah. because it's deemed as proper right. etiquette. So right. is that is that the way of the goyim or maybe. not? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. It, it, it's 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 interesting. Where does etiquette and the ways of the goyim come in? Right, yeah, totally. Because it, yeah. it, it, it's just an interesting way of looking at it. What What is the way of the goyim, and what is that this is just deemed to be a, a proper way of doing things. Right. And it, there's no negative to it. There's no religious backing for it. It's just right. believed to be that proper etiquette. But I, I was thinking at, at, a, at a baseball game, if you're wearing, if you leave a yarmulke on, people, I don't think anyone's going to give you a hard time. When I, when I was always growing up, it was... You have to take off your hat, but the yarmulke was left on. Yeah. Right. So the black hat came off, but the yarmulke was left on. Right. And so it was sort of a combination of what you're saying. Yeah. So the the more obvious hat part of things, as an etiquette, mm-hmm. was taken off, cap or, or whatever, and, but the yarmulke was left on. I, I don't know that that was customary or not, but that's yeah. what right, it always be. seemed to be. Could be. Yeah. I, was, I, I, don't, I don't think anyone will give you a hard time at a baseball game for leaving your yarmulke on for... Uh, mm. But I think in what you were saying... If they're, yeah. if they're giving you a hard time, it's for a different reason. Yeah, uh-huh. But yeah, but I think in what you're saying is I think the etiquette part was that uh, the hat part came off the yarmulke stayed off. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Because if Jews don't, if we don't recognize that we're separate, and one of the ways that just it expresses itself is that we dress different, then we don't have a chance. Also, we Jews always speak different too. Right? We always had Yiddish. The Svardim had Ladino. You go to Lakewood, you have Yeshivish. You can speak to someone you think you're speaking Yeshivish. yeshivish. It, it, it's a fusion of English, Hebrew, and Yiddish. And some Aramaic. There's a song. <laughs> I have to send you. The, someone made a song about it. I have to send you a song. We ever you ever speak to somebody from Lakewood and you don't know what they're saying? They're throwing in like Yiddish and Hebrew every other. Um, I've never had the opportunity right. to answer it, that in a positive way, anyway, <laughs> so I can't answer that. Question. Well, it, actually, David spoke <clears throat> in, a, in a minor way Yeshivish when he, when he gives these classes. He inputs words and phrases. In, but, in, in, but I in, I, no, I try no, to no, translate no, it. No, 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 but no, no. But I'm saying that that's Yeshivish. That that. You incorporate it because it's easier just to use what it is instead of start translating it because the, the translation never matches up to what it means. Right. It's so uh, and then you should and then Yiddish kind of jumps in there every so right. often. But my, I sort of cross boundaries <laughs> all over the place. But, yeah. Accepted everywhere. But but the but the point is that the Jew, Jews always had a special way to speak, a different way to speak. We have a different way to speak. We have a different way to dress. We have a different way we act, and it makes sense because we have a different goal in life. What's the what's the Jewish goal in life? You look at the Torah, you look at the Gemara. What does the Torah and Gemara and the Talmud and our our tradition tell us is important? Serve God, care about other people. Right? Is power and money a value in Judaism? Clearly not. Right? And if you look at the secular world, what are the values? Power, money, physical pleasure, and those are things that that we say that Pirkei Avos says take a person out of the world. You know, can a taiva uncovered? Funny in a way, right now with the uh, Mishnah Yomi doing two Mishnahs a day, they're going through all the laws of Israel basically. And if you look through it, there are so many different rules of that you have to give of your crop, of your animals, of your which should be your livelihood. Right. You give to the poor, you give to the leaders, you give to right. the uh, priests. So you would think that uh, I'm giving away things that are mine. And the Torah says that these things are granted to you so that you can and give to nothing others. Nothing right? yours. Exactly. Nothing is really yours. And that's why we have all these things. To show you that it's to humble you. Right? Don't think that this is all coming from you. Right. And we learn a lot of these from the laws of Israel. That right. you have to leave the corners of your field for the poor. Right. right? You have to not work the land and you have to believe that God will provide right. for you in, in the seventh year. All these various different things. It's to humble us and to say that we have to have faith in what the Torah says. That a Baruch will provide for us, and that he he knows better than our way of uh, uh, totally and figuring the, things out. But the to- and the Torah also knows that power, money, and physical pleasures are very enticing to people, right? Even to Jews, especially to Jews. So what the Torah says, how do we deal with that? We have to be separate. We have to be separate. So since the secular world has these values that are totally antithetical to everything we're supposed to live for. Just practically speaking, if we're going to be totally ensconced in it, I mean, in Manal, we're not, we don't live in Lakewood. It's one thing, right? You live in Lakewood and you block, even in Lakewood they can't really do it anymore. Maybe you live in B'nai Brock or Mayor Sharm. You could totally block out all these negative aspects of secular culture. Then maybe you have a chance. But especially us, you know, we live in Manalapan, to, in, the, in, the, in the, what people call the real world, as Rabbi Shnessy would say, but it's not the real world. But we're human beings, so we get enticed by that. So the Torah says you have to be separate. Right, you have to be. Your, your dress has to be separate. The way you talk has to be separate. Who, you, what, just so we don't get enticed by those uh, values. I think everybody, everyone wants to be accepted, wants to be powerful, wants to have money. It's a big gate Sahara. So the Torah recognizes. That's why you, when you have streams of Judaism, like we were talking about before, Reform, Conservative, and uh, different things, that they try to say, no, we're supposed to engage with the secular world. We're supposed to take their values. That's the exact opposite of what the Torah wants. The Torah recognizes we're human beings. These things, power, money, physical pleasures, they're very enticing. You know, who wouldn't want to be in the front page of the New York Times getting praised, how how important they are? Right, there was a certain person I just read. He wrote an article that was a little bit critical of the Orthodox community in the New York Times. And, you know, I don't think he would ever have done that if it wasn't for the honor he would have got. But now we can say that he was published in the New York Times. He's so... Right, people still do a little bit. Not as much as they used to do, but uh, unfortunately pe- people do. People will give... You know, give their values for power and, and prestige. I heard something the other day, just, a, uh, just on the, the side, it just really resonated with me. And, you know, people say, well, I created this, I created that. No, you didn't create anything. You just swapped something. Everything else right. was created by Hashem. 
you discovered it because he allowed you to. It's such, a, such an a- arrogance. Isn't it an arrogance to say that you created something? Someone told me they were in a nursing. I, that just re- I, I don't know why, but that just resonated with me. To, for somebody to say, I right. created that. No, you didn't. You may have discovered it, and you may have been allowed to discover it, but you didn't create it. It was created right. that, not by you. A, ra- a rabbi I know visited a nursing home, and there was this guy there. I mean, does that, uh, right? I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, and and th- this guy had invented 50 years ago some medical procedure that was like revolutionary, and he was such a famous doctor and so proud of himself. And he met him when he was an old man by himself in a nursing home. Nursing home. No one knew who he was. Nobody cared. You know, it's uh, like what you're saying. People are so proud of themselves that they have these accomplishments. In a few years, everyone forgets. No one cares. It's not important. So I say, who was the 21st president? Can anyone like rattle that off? Very few people. Maybe Alan Harberger could rattle it, it off. But the 21st president, whoever it was during his lifetime, was oh, oh, the president, the president. Now, what? A hundred years later, no one cares. <laughs> you know. That's why all these things are uh, hevel, a kol hevel, as uh, King Solomon says. It's all emptiness. The only st- stuff that lasts is mitzvos, and as the Ramban said, recognizing Hashem, living for that purpose. And it's very hard. There's a lot of Yitzhahars out there, so we try our best, and that's why we have to be separate from, uh, from everyone else. Okay, thanks for coming. Thank thanks for eating chalon. It's been a pleasure as always. Thank you. Thank you.